when one turns back to the book of Genesis and reads about the days before the great flood which God caused to come upon the earth to destroy men who love sin, whose mind was only on evil continually, and thereby point out that someday there will be a final and complete judgment of all men. And I would emphasize here parenthetically that every judgment of God that you read of in the Bible, whether it would be through the Noahic flood or any other judgment brought on men because of their sins of which they would not repent, that that just simply signals that there is a final judgment coming. Then, of course, we have explicit language telling us that. That having been said, one of the things that stands out about Noah and his family in a time when polygamy had entered the world, and yet that was completely contradictory to the way God set up marriage, one man for one woman, till death do them part, that it's highly significant in this patriarchal age where God speaks to man through the heads of the families, the patriarchs, the fathers. There is no written law at this time. And yet when you look at Noah, Ms. Noah, their sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and each one of their wives, it is highly important to note they're still keeping marriage as it was instituted in the garden, one man for one woman. And they have kept themselves in the will of heaven all this time. And when God looks at Noah, so to speak, he sees a man that is upright and faithful and dedicated to doing God's will no matter what anybody else did or did not do. And when you read over in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, in that great chapter on the hall of faithful men of the Old Testament, you'll see that he by faith did these things. And then when God told him how to escape the upcoming flood, by faith, he moved and built an ark to the saving of his house. His house, his family. That says a lot more than we even realize today as to his dedication to God according to the will of heaven that governed men at that time. Now as we look round about us today, and this has been going on all my life and of course even before, but of course it has certainly, like a snowball going down a mountain, it's gained speed and got much larger. When you see in the history of our nation that marriage is winked at, it's spurned, it's mocked. And today, every other marriage ends in divorce. That's the statistics, at least as I have read them. So for 50% of the marriages are ending in divorce. Well, that doesn't begin to cover the troubled marriages. They're greatly troubled. It doesn't begin to discuss people living with one another as if they were married, but they're not. It doesn't discuss all of those divorces and remarriages contrary to the will of heaven. We wonder about this nation and we pray about this nation, but if there were to be any one thing that could put this nation on the course it needs to be on, it would be to get marriage and the home back in line with the will of God Almighty. The home is the smallest unit of society. In it, everybody that makes up our society or culture or nation or any other is formed within that unit. Attitudes, outlooks, dispositions toward God, toward themselves, toward their fellow man, toward government, toward everything is to be shaped within that home. And when it's not, and especially when marriage, as God sets it out in Matthew 19, 6, and has really established it back over in Genesis 2, when it's not, it's just like pulling the foundation out of under this building. It can't stand. 
And so that's what we see where we are today. But we've gone even further than that. And what I have said so far doesn't surprise most people here, if anybody. But now we're having trouble with understanding that a man is a, is a man and a woman is a woman. And out of all of humankind, that's all there is. And you see it even in today's Olympics, causing all sorts of trouble with boxing matches where supposed trans, I don't know what you call them, trans whatevers, it's supposed to be women, but they're really men, and if they went by the biological situation, they would know. But they love to talk about science. You ever notice these people? They love to talk about science, science, science. But when science says you're a man, no matter how you carve your body up, then they don't want to pay attention to science. And so you've had that controversy going on. You have all manner of things concerning homosexuality. Homosexual marriage is no such thing. They're simply marriages for unnatural lusts. That's all they are. They're of the devil. They always will be. And yet here we are as the church of the living God, right in the midst of all this mess. What are we going to do? Well, I suggest we do like Noah. We just keep on doing what God said, the way he said it, and for the reason he said it. And I suggest to anybody, as I said a few weeks ago, that any time, because of where we are in this nation, the Constitution and so forth, the Bill of Rights, anybody that tells you you can't describe a person scientifically and be accurate, be right, then tell them they have no business trying to violate your right of religion to practice it. Put them on the spot. Do not let them put you on the spot. I never will forget many years ago, Brother Warren, the late Brother Warren was visiting, we were visiting together, in fact. <laughs> he was talking about being questioned and fielding those questions and people trying to ask him things in a public forum that would uh, cause him to appear wrong concerning belief in God and the deity of Christ or anything like that. And somebody said, Brother Warren, how does it feel to be on the hot spot? He never cracked a smile. Just as calm as he could be, he said, I won't be the one that's on the hot spot. And that's exactly the goal you ought to have, according to your several ability and preparation for anyone that challenges you concerning anything pertaining to godliness so when we look at our nation today, I would say there's an ominous pall that's hanging over us and a terrible storm that's already raging in a lot of places. And it's spiraling out of control. Movies and TV and radio and newspapers and magazines and pamphlets and, of course, in recent years, the Internet and all that's on that have brought vile and wicked things into our homes. We used to say television did. This still does. But not like the Internet. And so we have all sorts of divorce rates and no marriages at all and every kind of false marriage and all sorts of things called love that are really nothing but lust. I want you to remember that about Hollywood and the entertainment society. When they talk about making love, they're not talking about making love between a faithful husband and wife. They're talking about satisfying lust. Every time they say that, you just remember, Hollywood doesn't know a thing in the world for the most part about biblical love or the love a husband ought to have for his wife and vice versa. They're interested in gratifying lust. And that's what they think love is. But it's not. There's all kinds of delinquency. You used to talk about juvenile delinquency. You don't hear that anymore, do you? But it's there. Juveniles in their teens. Going astray. Getting into all sorts of messes. Well, they're still doing that. And even far worse and have for years and years and years and years. Problem is those early juvenile delinquents 
at least physically, grew up. Now, they didn't grow up mentally and emotionally and certainly not spiritually. They grew up living in that kind of, of life where God didn't make any difference. The Bible made no difference except to mock those things. And so we see that parents are delinquent. You used to see on television, it's 10 o'clock, do you know where your children are? That wasn't a bad thing. Somebody said, well, it's 10 o'clock, do you know where your parents are? It works both ways, and that's apt to be as in, uh, before us today as much as the other. So we have all sorts of faded hopes, all kinds of blown up dreams, and the homes are not places of security and teaching and training and discipline. They're just in a vile mess. Now, mess. I used to growing up here at sermons like this. And when I think of the situation back then, and I think of the situation today, yes, it was bad in a lot of places, but it's far, far, far worse today because more and more people are in that boat. And we're building on six, uh, previous generations that were already messed up themselves. Let me make this comment and please hear me. Rearing children correctly began back in your great-great-grandfather and grandparents' day. Because we build on those things. Well, if that is the case, then when there were things awful askew from God's teaching on marriage in the home several generations ago, what do you think is built on then? We do not go into the depths of evil just overnight. And that's true concerning marriage, as God would have it and teaches in the Bible, or the home. In the husband and the wife's relationship, the roles the father and mother have assigned to them by God's good word, the relationship of parents to children and vice versa, and how things are to be done. Back when I worked in child care a long time ago now, we were told in the teaching done at that time regarding the nature of children coming into care was that about 1970, you have to remember what happened among the young people in the 1960s. About 1970, the situation with children coming into care changed considerably, radically in fact. While before that point, most children coming into care had lost one parent and maybe another one was too ill to take care of them, or both parents were out of the picture and grandparents had them and they'd grown too old to take care of them and things like that. Thus the children in whatever home they had had a secure home and a normal home. It just could not provide for them anymore. And that's the kind of homeless children, put homeless in quotes, would come into care in what is commonly being called orphan's home. And yet that began to change in around 1970 because of all of the rebelliousness against marriage and the home that took place in the hippie days of the 1960s. Well, that's over 50 years ago now. So you've got grandparents and maybe great-grandparents, I guess so, who were back there and they were yippies and hippies back in those days and they were casting off all kinds of restraint and fighting against whatever there was that was the old way of doing it as they characterized it. And so you've got people today who hardly know God is as the Bible presents him. Here we are, the church in the middle of all this. Have we been left unscathed? No. Beginning in the 70s, men began to teach doctrines that went against the teaching of Matthew 19.6 and Matthew 19.9 concerning marriage and divorce and remarriage. You know, those doctrines that are false don't arise until people begin to live contrary to the truth of God's will, and they seek then to change the will of God in such a way as it condones their ungodly living. That's the way it always works. False doctrines arise to condone the false living, and the false living usually comes first. Then the doctrine to justify what they're doing. Now here's the point I want to make. We're still charged to preach the gospel to every creature. 
That's the job of the church. The church is a teaching institution. Now, there are three prongs whereby it does that. It's commissioned to preach the gospel to the lost, to spiritually edify itself and the teaching of the truth regarding being Christians, and then benevolently, we show the world, we care for those who can't help themselves with the idea that we'll be able to show them the love of God and teach them the truth. So regardless of whether it's the teaching of the gospel to the alien sinner or edifying the church or practicing benevolence, all three of those are designed to convert souls. No one of them is not. The church's job is to convert souls, and it does so in the three-pronged effort, and I just described it. But who, who, is, who is the soil? All these people I've been talking about. And even if they come from pretty good homes, they're, they're, they're further and further removed from an absolute objective standard of truth that is the Bible. And here is the point that hurts. Children cannot be raised in those situations, if you can call them being raised, and not be damaged goods to some extent doesn't mean they're damaged irretrievably. It means that they've come out of a situation where they didn't get what God wanted them to get. And they will have certain things about them the rest of their life that, that will scar them. No matter how godly they can be according to their several ability and opportunities, they'll have certain things they'll have to fight in their own lives to keep their lives in complete submission to God's will. That is a thing that needs to be considered deeply by a lot of folks. And let me say at this point, I've never been opposed to psychology. I've been greatly opposed to various false philosophies of psychology. The Bible is full of material that properly categorized with today's terminology and science would be called psychological. You cannot read all those passages on the heart and not realize he's talking about the mind. He's talking about the motives. He's talking about the purposing apparatus that God put in you. He's talking about your thinking. When, G, when Paul said, set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth, he's telling you how to think, what to meditate on, what to concentrate on. The Bible is full of material that properly classified in today's vernacular is simply psychology. I'm not opposed to science, but I'm opposed to science falsely so-called. Philosophies of science that are contrary to God's will. And that's where we are. We don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because the Bible is a book that deals with the inward man. Where the thinking goes on and the motives are and the purposes. And that's got to be considered. And if you look at how Jesus talks about our thinking and the peace that passes understanding, it begins with being reconciled to God through obedience to the gospel and all past sins remitted and added to the church. Until a person does that, they're not going to get the full benefit of the godliness and the contentment and the way to view this world and the way to live in it and to be able to oppose the devil and his minions. So we must, as the church, doing the best we can to be what God says we ought to be, we must know there are multiplied millions of homeless waifs that have fallen victim to this ungodly condition that we've been talking about. And we've got to understand there's more trauma out there that's mental and emotional. And it's, it's not trying to make a lot of people to say children growing up in the way I've tried to describe it lightly this morning are damaged goods. They don't have the roots in their life. They were deprived of those things. They grew up in a way God never intended them to grow up because they were in families if we might call them that and that would be loosely so where they didn't receive. They have a view of a lot. Let's put it this way. A lot of women today may think that a man is the most rotten thing under the sun, and thus they have a skewed view toward all men. Why? Because what they had as a, quote, father, unquote, 
was as uh, sorry as sorry could be with the apology to have to use sorry to describe it. You can't go through that and not be scarred. You ever cut yourself with a knife? I imagine we all have. I imagine most of us can point to the scar and say it's still there. It's not going away. Either. Well, what about the inward man and in the mind? Can it be scarred? It doesn't mean it's irretrievable any more than your body healing. But there can be some wounds in the body that you have to therefore favor that limb maybe from here on out because it just doesn't work like it used to. Well, that can happen regarding the inward man. So when I speak today of saying, let the Lord build the home, I mean be willing to submit to the teaching of the Bible to have the marriage and the home that the Bible teaches. Don't let your past life, whatever it's been, don't let it form your view of the way things are. Renew yourself by the renewing of the mind. Don't you know that's partly what's involved in Romans 12? When he says renew your mind, well, if you've got an old mind, what does that mean? You're going on old things and the way you view old, from old things, old perspectives, perspectives contrary to the teaching of the Bible. You have the power to change that. I ran across the other day uh, an old outline. I wondered if I still have it, had it. And I found it accidentally. And it was an outline that I prepared to speak at a baccalaureate sermon in my first year of full-time preaching. And I'd been invited to do that at the Hampton High School graduating class of, I think it was 1969. And I entitled it, I'm not quoting it exactly here, but what you have received, no power on earth can take from you. And I developed that into other things, but, but that's, that's true when it comes to good things. But it also says you have the power to change your life. The problem I'm speaking of now when it comes to children being raised, if you can call it that, in situations like I've described, is that these things will operate on you, and unless you're very careful with your thinking and very objective with it, you won't realize these things are causing you to have that attitude about somebody that it does. It's going to take some in-depth contemplation. Why do I react this way? Why do I act that way? You may not know because when we're forming our very outlook on ourselves, our families, and life, men and women, whatever, then that gets sort of built in and we just operate that way without giving close, in-depth consideration in the light of the parts of the Bible that bear on those things. There must be a lot of prayer and a lot of close scrutiny and realize these things have become entrenched in people's lives and they're not going to get rid of them overnight. And if you find yourself involved in something like that, you're going to have to zero in on those things. You may not see them until you study the Bible and those parts of the Bible that pertains to that kind of situation. But we in the church must realize that's what's happening in our country. So many of these people have come up in such a mess, they, that's what they would think of a home, they never knew and never have known and don't know what a godly parent is or what a godly home is or a godly marriage. They don't know. And if they've heard anything, it's to ridicule anything pertaining to God, Christ, the Bible, or anything he set up such as marriage and the home. Now, the big thing about that is, what are your children seeing in you? Will they see that skewed view that comes out of what you have become because of growing up in something like that? Or will they see something else? Oh, they're going to see it. You don't, have to, you don't have to worry about that part. They're going to see everything. They'll notice it. Just like you did. 
So never in the history of this nation has there been such a frontal attack against the sanctity of the home as set out in the Bible. The sexual freedom, license, lasciviousness is the cry of the land. And we'll all be caught up in that one way or the other if we are not exceedingly careful in particular. In 2 Peter 2, verses 12 through 13, But these, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it a pleasure to riot in the daytime. 2 Peter 2, 12 and 13. That almost sounds like it describes some things of recent times happening around here and the attitude of people, the outlook of people, the disposition of people on government, on society, on everything. It's a rebellious mindset. Where did they learn all of this? Well, they sent them off to college. Well, that's, a, that's probably where it was reinforced. But they learned it back at the place of ultimate learning and whatever they had as a home. So we foolishly give ear to one who has been divorced and remarried time and time again or living outside marriage or whatever you want to call it. And they're like, they're trying to train us. Well, they know all about women. They know all about men. They know how it all works. I had back ages ago, before all this became even as clear as it is now, a child psychology class. And a woman taught it, and I suppose at that time she was probably up in her 50s. You know how it is when you're that age, everybody over 40 looks 50 or 60 or 70. And I was probably about 20. But I'm guessing she was somewhere in her late 50s. PhD in psychology. And she sat before the class and basically tried to explain the actions of children as if they were rats and mice and maybe some of the better ones would have been hamsters. But I sat there wondering, what on earth? Now, I, I had a pretty good upbringing. You always realize that your parents could have been better even as you realize you could have been better. But I had better sense than that and then I asked myself the question, What's wrong with these kids that go and sit in a class like that and say, oh, I just heard some wonderful, marvelous things. First of all, my parents are stupid, and this teacher knows more than anybody else. I sat in another psychology class, and the guy was just fresh with his master's degree, the fellow that taught the class. And he was explaining that the only reason all this is supposed to link up with how we deal with us since we're all animals, you see. That a, a brooding hen, as we used to say, an old setting hen, that when you set her, all there is to it is the mechanism of she's got to a stage biologically where she wants to set on those eggs because they cool her. She's got fever. And so she rolls those eggs over and over, and that's how it works so they'll get the even heat so the little chicken will hatch. Well, I remembered something. And it was this, that if my grandfather didn't want one of his hens to set, he would take and put her in a coop all by herself where she couldn't set. And we just called it breaking her up. And after a period of time where she couldn't set, she quit. So, dumb little old me, I think I was a sophomore, I raised my hand and I said, if what you said is true, why does this happen every time? He said nothing. He was teaching what came out of his textbook and his professor said he'd never given any thought to it. Ask me more than that. Genetically speaking, who made the genetics that makes the thing work the way it works? 
All I'm saying is, if somebody nearly 60 years ago, at least 59, that didn't have exposure to all these things, didn't swallow that stuff, uh, line and sinker, pole line and sinker, maybe even the can of worms on the bank, if they didn't follow all of that, why can't other people? I don't consider myself above and beyond others with some sort of genius record, but I think I can think. Isn't that nice? I think I can think. Why just swallow things that are thrown out at you because somebody has a lot of degrees behind their name or if they don't? But people do. Who should be helping children not to do that? Mom and Daddy, the way they're raised. They ought to teach them to, to think a little bit. Listen to this, Jude 8. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Back some years ago, and sociologists have never been known for their conservatism on anything much, but there were some that were more determined to follow statistics and things like that, but they, they, they became alarmed over the disintegration of the home. They never, most of them, thought of the home as the Bible sets it out. But they realized that it's the smallest unit of society, and that's the reason they entered into the study of sociology, is they measured these particular things. And they realized there's chaos and ruin going on in the home simply because it's just not a place of teaching, and of strength, and of discipline, of imparting of wisdom and security. And let me pause here and say this about security. One of the greatest things your children need is security in the home. They don't need for a while to be concerned about the same thing their parents are. They need that security. And that security comes through proper tra training, which involves corrective discipline as well as preventive discipline. That needs to be understood. Parents who are trying to rear their children without discipline don't need to be parents. Now you think about that for a minute. That's part of what you do to help them get on their own two feet and make wise decisions when they're grown. It's not all of what you do, but it's part of it. Now the only avenue of escape from all I've said, and it will always be the only avenue of escape, is turning back to God, humbling ourselves and being willing to be guided by the truth of God's Word and do what's necessary to learn how to write and divide it, 2 Timothy 2.15. Here's why. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Now that's what's been going on for a long time in a number of areas, not just the home, but people are laboring in vain. It's pointless. Their labor is pointless when it's not done according to the will of heaven. All that building is to no good. Psalm 127 verse 1. God ordained marriage in the home. By the way, there shouldn't be a home as it's set out in the Bible except marriage precedes it. Let me say that again. In Matthew chapter 19, 6, God joined marriage. One man for one woman must precede, if it's acceptable to God, must precede the development of the home. That's how the home begins. It doesn't begin any other way. Well, I know of a lot of homes. You know of a lot of spurious homes. A lot of homes that are built upon the commandments and doctrines of men. Under the law of Moses, God gave his people all sorts of restrictions against marrying foreigners. We're not under the law of Moses anymore, but the principle comes out the same. We should be very careful, very, very careful as to who we marry. For once a home has been established, it's never really dissolved. It may not be what it ought to be. People may divorce one another contrary to what the Bible says, but that thing that started at one time still hovers around. It never leaves. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband 
so long as he liveth. Romans 7, 2. Listen to this. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. Matthew 19, 9. That's the only reason that a marriage should dissolve besides death of one spouse or the other. When one commits fornication. And it doesn't say even then it has to. If there can be reconciliation, that would be the best thing. But when a spouse commits fornication, the innocent spouse has authority from God to put that guilty of fornication spouse away and has the right to marry another. And that's the only way it works. You think the world's concerned about that around about us? And with every other marriage ending in divorce, don't you think that means you better tell your children to be cautious and careful and particular about what's going on? Well, if it doesn't, I don't know what I can say to help it out. Because Hebrews 13, 4 says plainly, let marriage be had in honor among all. Let me ask you that. You think that's happening today? Let marriage be had in honor among all. And let the bed be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Hebrews 13, 4. I don't care what's going on in politics or whatever else. That doesn't change that. We simply must build homes on the foundation of God's word. And that's all. Very quickly, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them, Colossians 3.19. might help to go back and study some of the way things were done back in the first century. It had been done for many generations regarding how they dealt with one another. But this is the responsibility of the husbands. If you're not going to do that, don't marry. But now listen to this in Ephesians 5. 25 through 33. Husbands, love your wives. How do I know how to love my wife? Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Well, let's put in a few more words here, or we'll skip on down rather to a few more verses. So ought men to love their lives as their own bodies. Then he said, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. Let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. It's sort of a two-way street, isn't it? Responsibility of the wife to the husband, husband to the wife, as God sets it out. Now, are there any perfect husband and wife relationships like this? No, because everything enjoined upon us, there's always work to be done in growth and development. But where can you find better marriage counseling? I'm not opposed to being a counselor. Just, it's just a matter of what are you counseling me to do? And where did you get that information? And what makes you think that'll work? If followed religiously, the course of action that I just noted here would cause divorces to cease. People don't want to work through anything. That's another problem we have. They don't want to stick with anything. If going gets a little tough, throw it up and run off from it. People must be taught that when you enter a marriage, that's for life, period. One old man told me in my first work, he'd joke about it. He'd always tell him some joke. But he said, uh, I told my wife she's never going to leave me because everywhere she wanted to go, I'm going. She can try to leave, but I'm going with her. <laughs> I always thought that was pretty good. He also had married twice. His first wife died. And I knew the whole family, brothers and sisters. They were old enough to be my grandparents. But he said, you know, she was such a wonderful wife. I just went back to that same fa family and married her sister. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. <laughs> Does that sound like something in the Old Testament? Does that sound like why you would send your son back up to a certain place to get a certain wife? There are other instructions. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. I just got myself kicked out of most places in America by saying that. That's not politically correct. Wives, submit. You realize submit as it does when we're taught to submit to elders' decisions. Submit means, well, I don't agree with it. 
but I'll do it. People don't like that today. People don't even think it ought to exist in the home. But that's what the Bible says. And read that way on the day of judgment. And think of the wives that will stand there and say, Yeah, but I didn't agree with him. So I went and did it my way. And the husband, again, loving his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. They're going not to realize that. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Then he goes on down and says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Ephesians 5, 22 and 24. Now, we talk a lot about what a person must do to be saved. He must believe in Christ. Then he must repent of his sins. Confess faith in Christ to be baptized for the rest of sins. And we quote Acts 2.38 and rightly so. In other verses like that. But I don't know that Ephesians 5.22 through 24 is getting quoted like we quote Acts 2.38. But it's going to be there on the day of judgment to judge us. So Jesus Christ does not rule over the church as a tyrant. But he rules out of love for our souls. He knows how to get us from earth to heaven. And so the husband must rule the house the same way. He must rule by love. The husband simply does not have the same role or work as the wife does and vice versa. Now where, let me ask you this, where are people going to learn those things? Well, we hear it preached like you're preaching now. We have a class taught on marriage in the home and the family. Yes, but where do you think it ought to be really instilled? Within the home itself. So this relationship does not foster strife, but it promotes peace and harmony as the Bible defines those things. The two, husband and wife, have become one. And the wife, by love, can win her unsaved husband, Peter even says, if he's winnable, 1 Peter 3, 1, simply by her godly living regardless of what he's doing. We think of children as offsprings of parents. Somebody called them, they're not offsprings, they're mainsprings. The birth of a baby revitalizes love. It cements the marriage in a way that I don't think anybody can understand until they go through it. And what a great blessing it is to the home. Children can be the moving force behind attaining happiness and peace in the home. But we must recognize them for what they are. As a psalmist in Psalm 127 verse 3 said, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord. So as a legacy from God, then we must accept our children as a very important part of the home. So much more could be said along this line. I won't attempt to do so now. But let it be said of you concerning your children when they come, if God blesses you with them and they grow up and become adults of what was said about Timothy. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.15 Fathers need to know, and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6.4 so on and so on. Let the wives, the mothers, guide the home and all that that means. And realize the force for good they are in molding those children to be what they ought to be. Children must obey their parents. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the earth which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Exodus 20 verses 1 and 2, or 12 rather. Paul quotes this passage also, I might say, in Ephesians 6, 2 through 3. Then in Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Who determines the right? God. It's right because God said so that children obey their parents. And on we could go. 
So how do we face the mess the Lord's church is in today? Not just internally, but I mean primarily the society or culture we're in. We do it just like all these people have always done it. Noah, Abraham, Joseph. What made Joseph be able as a very young man to resist the temptation that came upon him when Potiphar's wife tried to get him to do what she wanted him to do in immorality. He didn't just happen to have that conviction. Because remember what he said? How can I do this great sin? He knew what was right and wrong. He didn't just get it out of the blue sky. It was taught him for his day and time. And so it will be on down through time. And then young people, be instructed. Be willing to listen to people who have been where you haven't been. You may get there. But don't just listen to anybody. Let them prove themselves by the truth they teach and the truth they live and the truth for which they contend and have given their lives to. I found that to be exceedingly profitable when I was a teenager and on through my young 20s. I gravitated to the older people. Not just anybody that was chronologically old, but those that proved themselves to be for God no matter what. And proven it by their life. And I think Jody and I can remember several, several, especially elderly women, who when we were just newly married and what they meant to us and their dedication, and the more we got to know them, the determination. And I'm thinking now of Sister Effie Huddleston. And some of them like that. Cultivate those things. Dodge the way the devil through the world tries to pull you away. This is the way that's right. And cannot be wrong. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we urge you to obey him today and become a Christian. If you're not, as a child of God, are you faithful or have you walked back on him? If so, repent of those sins, whatever they may be. <laughs> Come confessing them and we'll pray with you and for you that you might be restored to your first love. So if you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.